This is the um, October 22nd meeting of the Conway Board of Selectmen, or Select Board if you prefer. Um, we're being taped by um, Frontier Community Access Television tonight for viewing by our residents and the public uh, later on. Uh, first item of business, uh, public comments. Do we have any public comments? I don't see any of the public here, so we don't have any public comments. But okay, old business. We don't have any old business either. All right, new business. We have to sign the election warrant for the November 6th election. Has everybody had a chance to look over the election warrant? A fine warrant. Okay, it is a fine warrant. And I'll make a motion that we um, sign the warrant. So we can get it posted in time. Do I have a second. second? Yes. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Okay. This is very solemn stuff. We have. Mm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, anything else we have to do with that? No, nope. we're done That's it. for that. Okay. Next item on the agenda is preventing youth substance abuse, and we're going to have a, uh, a presentation by the Franklin Regional Council of Government, Pat and Alana. Ladies, take it away. Thank you, and thanks for having us here. I'm really glad to be here. This is um, a project that we're doing with the FERCOG with DLTA funding, um, offering some information technical assistance to different towns. Alana has been to several other towns um, so far and we're just transitioning who is um, working on this project right now because Alana, we just got a large grant to work just in Greenfield, so Alana's gonna be focusing more there. Um, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Communities That Care Coalition because we serve all of Franklin County and the North Quabbin. Um, and I wanted to tell you about youth substance use, what trends we're seeing in the region, um, which are also the trends that we're seeing at Frontier, um, and a little bit about what works in prevention, what we know works in prevention <coughs> in the school, in the uh, family, and particularly in the community. And we are flexible and easygoing, and you can stop us anytime and redirect us, um, ask questions, and so on. So um, the Communities That Care Coalition started in 2003 um, and it was actually started by folks from the business community um, from Mike Fritz of Rug Lumber and the um, Chamber of Commerce and so on. Uh, Channing Beat the, um, mm -hmm. used to own the Communities That Care national system and they had hundreds of coalitions around the world and around the country but none locally. So they approached community action and we started our own initiative. So the Communities of Care system nationally is a research-based or evidence-based program that's been shown to help, to, to be effective in helping communities reduce substance use. It's a community planning system. So you start by looking at your community's local data from youth and from other sources. And then you look at the national research and you implement the strategies that are known to address the particular issues you have. So the, we do the survey um, every year. We do a teen health survey every year in all of the public school districts in Franklin County and the North Quabbin, um, including Frontier and including Franklin County Tactical School where some of your students might go and Four Rivers Charter School. Um, and we provide a school specific report to each school that they maintain control over the results of. And those results are, you know, are theirs, but we can help analyze them, do further analysis. We also then aggregate all of the data for all of the um, school districts, and we provide that to the community. And we have that data available on our website, um, communitiesthatcarecoalition.org. And it's rich with information because we've been doing this survey every year since 2003. Um, so we have some of the best data in Massachusetts for our students right here. Um, more than 75% of students are part of that final sample after we do the data cleaning. And you have reason to believe they're truthful. Or That's a good question. Uh, it's, um, I, I should have said it's only 8th, 10th, and 12th grade students. So I would say we know that not every student is perfectly truthful, right? Some students might underrepresent the truth. Some 
some students might overrepresent the truth. In general, we, we use national surveys that have been validated and tested against um, other measures, including you know blood draws and so on, and we know that they're pretty valid. Um, not 100% not valid, but pretty valid. And one thing that's really um, useful is comparing year to year, because there's no reason to think that more kids would be lying this year than next year than the following year. So the trend lines are very um, reliable. Um, and we actually use three different surveys in a three-year cycle so that we get a breadth of information. Um, they're all th three national surveys. One is the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System, or YRBS, which you may have heard of. That's used all around the country. It gives us information on everything from like seatbelt use, um, sexual activity, helmet use, uh, food and um, screen time and all of that, as well as substance use. We use also the Prevention Needs Assessment, which used to be called the Communities That Care uh, Youth Survey. And that gives us information specifically about youth substance use and the underlying risk and protective factors. So the national research shows us that there are about, um, well, the national research has sort of uh, identified what the, the uh, 20 or delineated 20 risk factors and 10 protective factors that are shown to be closely connected with and lead to substance use or be causative or protective. Mm -hmm. So, you know, similar to with heart disease, we've got nutrition, we've got physical activity, those are the risk factors. And instead of telling people, hey, don't have a heart attack, we tell people, you know, what to do in terms of diet and exercise. And the same is true for substance use. You know, back when I was in school, it was say no to drugs and Nancy Reagan. And um, now we know that that is not what works. What works is to look at the risk factors in the school, in the community, and in the family. Mm -hmm. And to then look at what programs have been shown through research to be able to change those risk factors. So as an example, um, our data shows that um, we have higher levels of family management problems, which is measured by a set of, I don't know if it's six or nine questions, something like that on the survey um, about, you know, do your parents know who you're with all the time? Do you have a curfew? Is it enforced? Would your parents notice if you came home drunk? That kind of thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's, um, that's one of the risk factors that is elevated here. And then we know there are a set of programs that have been shown to be able to reduce that risk factor, evidence-based parent education programs and so on. So then those are the things that we implement. So that's a little um, snapshot of that community was, uh, care. 20 risk factors and 10. And 10 protective factors. Protective factors. And we measure all of those and we can compare, um, you know, every Every time we do this prevention needs assessment survey, we can get a check and see how those risk and protective factors are coming along. Um, and actually a big piece of the reason that we're here today is that um, one of the risk factors is called community laws and norms favorable to substance use. And that is closely linked with whether or not kids end up using um, drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And that is a risk factor that is particularly <laughs> high for us in um, the Franklin County North Quabbin region. So it's a priority for us to work on that. And we have seen some um, improvements in that risk factor over the years, but there's, there's obviously, there's more that we can do on a community level. I've seen the billboards going into Greenfield. Yes, mm. yes. Uh, yeah. the, you probably saw, right now there's one up that's uh, make time for family time. Um, okay. That's one of ours. Um, as a matter of fact, I brought you, um, when we talk about our family risk factors, this is, um, we have sort of a, a campaign promoting family dinners. I'll show you over mm -hmm. there. Um, <laughs> promoting family dinners and family time. I brought a goodie for each of you to bring home or give to somebody that you know with uh, kids. Um, so make time for family time. This is just one of one of the things. These are um, conversation starter cards for families to use at the dinner table. Dinner is one of those times that represents um, the two core elements of parenting, which are warmth and structure, right? And mm -hmm. I mean, okay. you can really embody that in dinner. You can embody it in many other times sure. too, but dinner is a great opportunity. Until your kid goes militant vegan and you can't sit down <laughs> to something. 
That's when you help teach them to cook yeah. and they get involved in the cooking. <laughs> so, so you have cards to start oh, conversations? Yeah. Cards. So this is for little kids, but for families that you know might struggle keeping their kids at the table, my goodness, do kids love these cards. They're extremely popular. It's um, a conversation starter. It's a conversation starter, so that so you're not. Parents, parents don't have enough to talk about with their kids. <laughs> it's a conversation starter. And all think, of this assumes that you have family dinner, which is all of well, that, that assumes is extremely important that, that, that you dinner. that you have the ability to make some time for family time, whether it's dinner, breakfast, car yeah. rides. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and it is challenging. I mean, uh, people are busy. People are working multiple jobs. Um, mm -hmm. So we just try to. Um, try to encourage that whenever when you can find that quality time whether it's game night or um, car rides or whatever to do it so that's the kind of thing um, we also we work very much with the schools the schools are um, certainly our number one um, partner and I, I sort of forgot to say that our coalition is a coalition you know we are you know we have our little puzzle pieces we have um, schools involved, uh, parents and families, young people, hospitals, human service agencies, local <coughs> governments, um, the district attorney's office, and so on. And um, But schools are one of our most important partners, and we do work closely with Frontier. In addition to doing the survey, we have worked with all of the um, public middle schools who are now implementing um, uh, an evidence-based program called Life Skills, in, mostly in their health classes. Uh, that's where it is at Frontier. Um, so all of the at Frontier, it's seventh and eighth graders are getting this program. That's 15 sessions in seventh grade, 10 sessions in eighth grade. We are hoping to get it into the ninth grade at Frontier also. There's a five session booster program. Um, and that's been shown to be very effective because it's not just about like, this is what drugs do to your brain. There's a tiny bit of like myths and reality, not a tiny bit, there's some amount of myths and realities about substance use, but most of the program is based on social skills and emotional skills. So we know that those are the things, you know, if you have the social skills to invite a friend out to do something healthy or, um, you know, be at a party and chit chat with somebody without needing a crutch in your hand or, you know, needing to, to um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Dis, not incentivize. Oh my gosh. When you drink, you become dis uninhibited. Uninhibited, thank you. Yeah. I was gonna say more fun to be around. <laughs> and if you, you know, <laughs> don't need that. So in any case, those social skills, those emotional skills, if you um, are feeling particularly blue and you have good skills for dealing with that, that's very different from then if you're feeling particularly blue and you find, um, you know, you, you try a prescription drug and it, it um, you know, mis misuse of prescription drug off label. Um, so that's the life skills program. Go ahead. What, what do you find as, as the three <clears throat> greatest risk factors? Oh, wow. Well, our three biggest priorities in this region. Um, and we've set this as a coalition, so this is not just me speaking, but sort of um, as a community, folks have said um, family management problems. Which, which encompasses? Um, it encompasses uh, that warmth many, and structure, many things. Many okay. things. Okay. Um, how much do parents... Again, live? not being able to spend enough time together. Right, right. Okay. if you don't know what your kids are up to and what they're doing, if you don't have okay. clear rules. If you don't um, have clear enforcement so, of those so, rules or consistent so enforcement. So structure and warmth, so discipline as well as love. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that's important combination. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's one of them. Uh, I would say number one. Mm -hmm. um, number two, community laws and norms favorable to substance use, and that is about young people's perception of whether adults in the community care if they are drinking, using marijuana, um, smoking, and so on. Do adults in the do young people think that adults in the community think Don't this is a rite of passage? Like, of course they're doing it. They're teenagers. Or do young people think like, oh my God, if I got caught, I would be in trouble, or people would be upset, people would be disappointed, or if I, if I, you know, we ask questions in the survey like, if you were out on the street drunk, would anyone notice? Or if you were, you know, smoking, mm -hmm. using marijuana on the street, would the police notice? Would any adults in your community notice? That's the kind of thing. Well, well, that's certainly the way my generation grew up was. Well, you don't want to do this because. And I think for my generation, that was not 
necessarily the case um, for many of us. And you see it in the data, you know, that, that uh, when we were in high school, the rates of substance use were much higher than they are now. Um, and I, mm. I sort of forgot to say one of the really important things is that we care a lot about youth substance use because youth substance use contributes a lot to later addiction and oh, problems. Oh, absolutely, sure. Um, you know, someone who waits until they're over the 21 to begin drinking is far, like five times less likely to develop a problem with alcohol than someone mm -hmm. who starts before they're 15. Sure. Um, yeah. And, you know, we know that the developing brain just responds really differently to drugs and alcohol. Um, we know that kids are learning coping skills when they're going through adolescence and if they are relying on substances then they don't learn those coping skills sure. so um, so it sounds like I don't need to get into why we care about youth use mm -hmm. and we really um, communities of care is about preventing youth use so you know there is absolutely an open debate about legal marijuana and so on and mm -hmm. um, uh, though we now have legal marijuana but the point that w Over that's 21, not though. Over 21, and that's not the issue. For us, the issue is how do we make sure that as we roll out legal marijuana and as vaping comes into play and so on, that we make sure that our young people are not, that they're getting the message that, 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 that it's not for them until they're older. I mean, I think we've done, you know, we've been doing a better and better job at this with alcohol. Uh, we've done a pretty good job with this with cigarettes. You know, cigarettes have been legal for a long time. Our rates of smoking have gone way down. Um, we need to make sure that we're responsible with the messages that young people get um, as we roll out legal marijuana and as vaping comes into play and as all these new substances come up. Um, so... Is vaping... <sighs> Yes. A particular to marijuana you're talking about? Actually, or I'm talking about tobacco. Also. Tobacco more than anything, mm -hmm. but vaping in general, because we don't always know what's in um, vaping devices, and young yeah. people themselves don't always know. Um, vaping, so I'll tell you that youth substance use has been declining dramatically. Um, it's been declining across the country, but it's been declining far more in our region. So, so youth are talking, what, 14 to 21? I'm talking the 8th, 10th, and 12th graders that we survey, so okay. high school age, middle and high school age youth, really good question. Um, so alcohol use, when we first measured it, was 47%, um, sorry, 47% of uh, the students that we surveyed when we started in 2003 said they had drank in the last 30 days. Now it's down to, oh my God, my eyes are so bad, 25%. Really yep, 25%. Is that because there's a substitute? Well, not in the case of alcohol. Um, binge drinking, I'll get to that, good question. Binge drinking is also down from 29% to 13%. Um, marijuana, down from 29% to 21%. Um, it's kind of flatlined lately, as you might anticipate. Cigarettes, down from 19% to 6%. Mm. That's where there is a substitute. Um, and But it's only a very recent substitute. The line's been going down, 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 and then mm -hmm. boom, um, Vaping is now at so, and I'll, I'll pass these out as, at a certain point. So, so you're here. differentiating va vaping and, cig and smoking and cigarettes. cigarettes. Uh, we are differentiating oh, that, but it is they are both uh, tobacco products, nicotine. Yeah, but I, but I heard I heard a report was it yesterday or the day before that vaping actually has more nicotine than cigarettes do. So essentially, you're getting kids hooked on nicotine better. Yes through vaping than you are yeah. with cigarettes. You know, it depends, and we just don't know because the FDA has declined to um, regulate e-juices, e as they're called, which is really like the, the vaping um, mm -hmm. chemicals. Um, they've declined to regulate that until they are now saying they will do it soon, but it has not been regulated. So, you know, you can find products on, the, on shelves that say zero milligrams of nicotine on the front and on the back, in the fine print, it says, this product contains nicotine. And then when they test it, they find these products can have you know, up to 24 milligrams of nicotine, may have way more than cigarettes. Yeah. One pod of Juul mm -hmm. contains as much nicotine as I think a pack of cigarettes, but I just learned the Department of Public Health just published something that says, there's something about the way that the nicotine is 
refined. So even if it's the same amount of nicotine, it's actually more addictive. This What's nicotine. Juul? Juul, good question. Juul is to vaping as Kleenex is to tissue. Juul is the number one brand. They are. Um, they started in 2013, and they are now a 16 billion dollar company. That's J U U L. Thank you. Yes, and it looks like a USB port. Um, yes. It yeah. is. It is a little device that looks like a USB port. You charge it on your computer. It clicks on like a magnet onto your computer USB thing, and um, it's popular with kids because it is sleek and stylish. It's packaged like an iPhone to look, mm -hmm. you know, very. Yeah sleek and it um it hides like a usb port and so parents and teachers don't even know what it is when they see it um there are also lots of vaping e-cigarettes so it looks like a thumb drive it looks like a thumb drive yeah. a little little long i said usb port uh -huh. right a thumb drive and they also have them that look like pens they also have them that look like asthma inhalers so they are specifically designed to trick that ones that look like credit adults. cards they have ones that look like credit cards. That's exactly right. right. Just, the just, thickness of just a couple of credit cards. And I have seen it demonstrated me to to me by youth mm -hmm. um, of the technique of being of mimicking the tying of the shoe in the school hallway mm -hmm. to, uh, and it's, to to use their vape, um, and it's smokeless, and it, that you can't catch them. It doesn't even trigger on a metal detector, and they're up and walking down the hallway, and nobody can. T it, Mm -hmm. Kids can actually get high all day long in school and and be so addicted to and nicotine. they can be under 24-7 surveillance while they're doing it. You're yeah. saying high and you're saying nicotine. They um, want you well, to think that the, they're, they want you to think, all those things are, are do, just a, do, they all, they all, they can take one of those jewel pens and mm -hmm. add a little insert to do their uh, oil whatever uh -huh. thingy uh -huh. and, then, and they can buy them fixings for the oil at the gas station and then they can go home and either blow up your house or make their own oil like mm -hmm. that in, mm -hmm. with, with a two-step process that yeah, it's um, just a whatever. nicotine delivery system. That's yeah, all or is. a marijuana, del a, a THC delivery. Yeah. It can be either or. Yeah. Um, now, to be clear, I want to point out one thing that we really, really want to communicate huh, is that to everyone out there <laughs> is that um, most kids are not. Most kids are not vaping. And that's really important. Like, we're all so alarmed about this new trend, all mm -hmm. of us here, and we should sure. be. Yeah. But we need to not accidentally send the message to young people that everyone is doing it. Because that's, you know, that's an invitation. Like, oh boy, if I don't keep yeah, up right. with my right. friends, then I'm on yeah. the outs. Peter we need Perfect. to remember that, oh, what's 100 minus 22? We have 22% of youth reported recent use of e-cigarettes, vaping, or juuling. 22%? 22%. One in four. One in four. Whoa. Um, That's pretty high. I'm it's very it's high. It's that low. I, it's very high. Uh, but it is way I, lower than kids think. And yes. It is, yeah. And so we need to make sure that kids don't think that everybody's doing it or that 80% of kids are doing it because 78% of kids are not juuling, vaping, using e-cigarettes. And that's, mm. that's a really important mm. message that we... Uh, just going back to one thing, uh, you gave the decline in percentages uh, for binge drinking and marijuana, but not for alcohol use. Um, what, what was what's yes, the alcohol. It we went from forty-seven percent to twenty-five percent. To twenty-five yeah. percent. Yep. Mm -hmm. We can also send so you. So that's almost cut in half. Yes. Alcohol, yes. Sure. Almost cut in half, and cigarettes have been cut in about a third. And yes, binge drinking has been cut in more than half. Um, so it's pretty impressive. We. Franklin County is on the map. I mean, places around the country know about our work. We've been written up in all kinds of publications. We've spoken at the White House. Um, this is, there's good work happening here. And what, what makes it good work is that there's lots and lots and lots of different things happening in coordination. So it's not, there's no silver bullet. You know, it's not just the program in the schools, but that's part of it, you know, and um, the school nurses uh, are doing screenings of all um, ninth graders plus one other grade. Um, now sort of similar to when they do screenings for school scoliosis, but they ask five questions about substance use and they get kids referrals if they need them. Um, so there's a lot of pieces in the school, in the community, in the family um, that all kind of come together to make it. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the drug program that my kids had when they went through. All How old are your kids? Uh, it was 10, 15 years ago. All stars, I bet. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. sure? Yeah. Okay. All-Stars, when the coalition got started... Which they thought was not effective. Okay. 
<laughs> well, Allsters uh, is 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 a program that has been shown to be effective with the research and was um, being done in Franklin County when we got that started when the coalition first got started in about 2003. There was still dare happening um, at that time uh, in in some places too, but in any case, um, now it's life skills. It might have been dare. Yeah. It might have been dare. Yeah. Yes, that dare was around, and before 15 years ago, dare was much more popular too. Um, dare has been. The old DARE program has been shown to be not effective. There were tons and tons of resources put into that with all the best That was the intention. one that, it's not just not effective, that was the one that the more you were exposed to DARE, the more likely you were to use drugs. Yes, in many cases it was found to be less than effective. And that's one of the main messages that we have, like, that our coalition has, is that if you put a bunch of smart, well-meaning people together in a room and said, what are we going to do to prevent use substance use, you'd come up with a set of activities that might look like dare, it might look like drug sniffing dogs or smashed up cars on the front lawn of the school, um, all great ideas, but not actually necessarily what works. When, when you look at what the research has shown works versus what well-meaning people think of, it's a Venn diagram without mm. a ton of overlap. Mm -hmm. So that's our job, is to be out there telling people what works. What works is changing community policies, you know, where there's retail stores, making sure that things are not easily accessible, making sure that there's not tons of visibility, having good uh, law enforcement, um, having great parenting programs, having kids really well connected to their families, you know, all of these mm. different things that aren't necessarily what you think of when you think of youth substance use prevention. You know, we think of like the just say no and um, dare and that sort of thing. So we have... Um, so can, can I ask you guys, I, it, it seems like I hear you use the terms youth, youth substance abuse and youth drug use interchangeably. I am so glad you said that. I should not be saying abuse. Mm -hmm. I, I, I may very well have said it, but we have changed our vernacular um, and there's a reason for it. Um, so we, we tend to use the word preventing youth substance use or misuse if we're talking about prescription <coughs> drugs, misuse of prescription drugs. Uh, we used to talk about youth substance abuse. Um, the, the reason that, that people are changing the terminology and like the State Department of Substance Abuse Prevention changed their name to Substance Addiction Prevention is um, there's a researcher out of Harvard that has done these studies where he comes up with a scenario about someone with a substance use problem, person with a substance use problem, and you change the title, whether you say abuse or whether you say, you know, or a substance abuser or an addict, and you change it, or change it and say a person with a substance use disorder. And then you show it to doctors, nurses, medical assistants, lay people, and you ask them, does this person need treatment? Does this person need, you know, um, uh, Punishment, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And you get a different response depending huh. on what terminology you use. Abu you know, if you're an abuser, that sounds like you're hurting people, you know, so and, and whereas you might be hurting yourself, that's not the that's not the, the feeling that comes across to people. So we actually have with us a pledge. It's um, from Great Kids Center for Addiction. It's the end the stigma campaign and the stigma. And it's um it's a little uh, summary of what words have been found to be non-stigmatizing and what words have been found to be stigmatizing. And it's a pledge that says, I, I will work to use these non-stigmatizing words. Um, because we know that when we reduce stigma, it helps people get into treatment, which is what we want. Um, it's what we want, at least. <laughs> um, so we'll leave these pledges with you. Um, you so can that's the addiction theory of the disease? <laughs> That's exactly, exactly. Which is, uh, now, now yeah. isn't, isn't, aren't those stigma words better before people get into abuse to keep them from getting into abuse? That's a good question. I, I have never heard any research on that. I wouldn't believe so, but I, I couldn't say. I couldn't well, I say. remember when I was of the age where I could have, you know, been abusing alcohol. The last thing I wanted was for people to think right. that I was someone who was abused. So, like you're alcohol. you're saying, there might be some role for stigma to keep people out of uh, getting absolutely. into that court. You know, I think I think there may be Look, some. For everyone like that, there was another one that drank because he wanted the girls to think that he was cool, exactly. and so that he had to drink. So that so the stigma, more stigma, like the more stigma, the better for that kid. So, well, that, <laughs> that's, that's, that's true too. It, yeah. it's, it's, it's an interesting question. one. Um, 
But one thing we're, we're trying to do, and we're going to leave these with you, is that um, you'll see at the end of our little presentation here, which we're giving um, to you, you'll see humble tiny pictures that are too small to see, but this top <laughs> one is um, the Greenfield Police and Deputy Chief um, and another person holding their stigma pledges that they signed, and then this is for COG staff doing the same. Just in, And then people put them up on their website sometimes, so mm -hmm. you can consider if you want to... If you feel like signing them, then you can put it up on your website or not, you know, with a picture of yourself holding the pledge, and it's sort of like a, a thing that gives <coughs> an impression about the culture that you're creating in the town. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be, you know, any kind of community leaders together. It doesn't have to be just the select board. It could include, you know, law enforcement, you know. Boards of health. Yeah, yeah. boards of health. Are so. there, like, longitudinal studies of looking at kids when they were... 14 to 18 or something or other, and then when they're 30 or 40. Yeah. And, there are a few, and, but there are, yeah. Uh, oh, and, and go on, ask and Well, and what worked? I mean, you know. It, mm. Oh, mean, you mean I, in prevention. I mean, to me, we're worrying about all of these things that feel relatively low level. I mean, you know, yes. you know, it, you know I, I, I wouldn't consider it terrible if I learned one of my kids had smoked marijuana when they were in high school. Right. But, um, but but if I learned that my kids were addicted to OxyContin or heroin, right, right. you know, suddenly we're on a whole different level. Right. And, 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 and I think there's also even, even with um, substances that you might find less, you know, there's a difference between smoking once or twice and smoking regularly daily where it makes it harder to learn, where it makes it, you know, um, so... Yes, there have been some longitudinal studies, both of the effects of smoking marijuana regularly or using regularly, and also of um, these programs. Like, for example, the life skills program, you know, th that's been studied extensively with randomized controlled, you know, okay, we'll randomly select which schools are going to get this program and which schools are mm. not. Um, and every you know these programs that we latch on to and really um, push are the ones that have been studied with experimental control trials over over in many cases decades um, the life skills program has been shown to if you went through it when you were in middle school your chances of using um, prescription drugs off-label misusing prescription drugs are far lower when you're in your 20s than if you hadn't gone through the program so. See, that, to, to me, as a parent, to me, the, the part of this that parent, that I, I feel like as a parent, there's just no support in, and that your your the use of your language just it, um, that it's use equals abuse, and mm. that 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 the, the kind of questions, the conversations I have with my daughter is about sort of harm reduction, harm reduction, and and about kids. I mean, in the the brain chemistry studies are, you know, the, the, the desire for consciousness expansion is hardwired in the human being amongst the, a major pr proportion of the population. Mm -hmm. And that there are kids from early on that want to experiment with stuff. Yes. And, and, and you, you, I'm glad you it, said it, it's that. really hard to, to say you can't use any of that stuff, but if you're going to use it, be reasonable. But, uh, you know, but there's people saying all use equals abuse and yeah. they're it's really hard to have that conversation that. because what you want them to do is try it once or twice and move on and not get not get stuck on it and and just move on and right. you know and to be be part of life it's you, you don't want them to get into it where they they then and, and uh, like if you make it bad, if you make it evil, there's a major segment of the kid that oh this is what your parents don't want you to do right. this is what we have to do and what and, I would say is um I totally agree. And if you want your kids to only use it once or twice and move on, the best thing is to have them delay first use. And so when we're talking to, mostly we're, well, like these programs that we're talking about are mostly for middle school kids, right? So with middle school kids, the message is like, don't use, you know? You, you, what we're trying to do is delay first use because the longer you delay, the lower your chance of addiction. And so it kind of ends up being a no use message because we're talking to these younger kids and we're trying to get them to delay. And we are seeing, you know, our, I, you, you heard me talk about the data. When we look at just eighth grade, those numbers poof, have gone way down. And that's what we look at, actually. We look at the eighth grade more than we look at the 12th grade because what we're really trying to do is delay first use of whatever it is. Um, delay first use is where where the the harm reduction really comes in. Yeah. So. Is is there any data you're tracking 
uh, that shows a reduction in social skills <coughs> due to electronic devices that people mm. are using? We are looking at that. What we, um, what we are seeing right now uh, is a significant uptick in depression. I shouldn't say depression, depressive symptoms as we measure them on our survey, which is not the same as Because people depression. are getting lonelier because they're using electronic that devices. That is the theory. That is the theory, mm. right. And it's, it's not just people, it's girls. Much more than boys. Much more. Than Much boys. more than boys. Okay. Um, we see in our data that uh, since uh, six years ago, um, the rate of depressive symptoms among girls has gone up, and we do see a Smart correlation. Phones. We do see a correlation <laughs> between screen time and um, mm -hmm. depressive symptoms. Uh, sure. We don't have measures for. And why smart girls? Does anybody have any? More emotional. Um, I mean, I have personal theories as the parent of a boy who, now that he's friends with girls, all of a sudden the social media stuff has exploded, whereas his boyfriends are not on the social media. This is my own personal theory. Our our data doesn't tell us really any of this, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but um, but when we talk to um, school counselors and administrators, they they share this theory that we kind of have that um, social media is is very likely one of the big drivers of this um, trend in depressive symptoms among girls. Mm -hmm. So it's something we really need to start paying attention to and worrying about. So girls sure. dominate on social media much more than boys? I don't know. We don't have uh, that, um, hmm. have that yeah. information yet, but we will, we will do our best to get it this year. And, yeah. and, and how much of the decision, what, what, what I am always interested in is the, you know, the, uh, how you keep them from trying opiates and how you, the, there's that one choice that they make mm -hmm. That yep. they know can kill them, yep. and that they've never made that choice before. Yep. And what goes, what goes on? How do you get them to avoid getting to that point? Right. And and um, that's also about that's that's why we talk about you know that's not the only reason. That is one of the big reasons why we talk about reducing nicotine, marijuana, and alcohol consumption. We know you know, that one can lead to another. I mean, I hate to sound like gateway drug-ish, but this is, the data bears out that mm -hmm. getting into one thing can, can nobody goes straight to, to um, you know, cocaine. Uh, it, there's, there are steps along the way. Um, there's also some studies, like uh, rat studies, that have shown that when rats have been, ex I don't remember if it's rats or mice, so I apologize, but when they've rodents. been, when these <laughs> rats have one's been, just than <laughs> exposed to nicotine uh, regularly, then when they're exposed um, to opioids, they get addicted much more quickly. Um, so there's something mm. about priming the brain for addiction. Um, the same is maybe true for sugar and other like addictive substances sure. but one addiction can lead to because it's the dopamine centers all, like almost all addiction is yes, the dopamine, dopamine centers of the brain sure. so if you've already got this ramping up it one thing can you know turn into the next yeah and i'm not i'm not trying to sound all um free for madness and we're not <laughs> teetotalers but that is that is why we work on preventing youth substance use i mean also the fact that um you know, we know that there are tons of people still dying from alcohol-related disease and uh, tobacco-related diseases, um, but also these things can lead to other problems, whether it's violence or other kinds of addiction. So. Yeah, I mean, I think opioid op opiates are the number one cause of death for those under 50 now in this country every year. And I mean, and it's, it's just a staggering total, mm. um, and it's declared an epidemic. Yes. Um, Absolutely. And to me, th there's uh, just from my own life, my own life experience, the people that I know that have chosen to use opioids were depressed and, and that you could see, see it coming. And some of them ended up committing suicide or otherwise yeah. devoting their lives to self-harm. Yeah. And um, and so t to me, the thing is like the mental the mental health framework that we have and the fact that our schools, you know, even Frontier that does a really good job at it. There's one adjustment counselor mm -hmm. when there should be three that and but it, it's not fair to put the burden of financing that on us the little taxpayer yep. to those are high price positions yeah. yes. um and that all, all of our schools um are are not financially able yeah. to su give the mental health support that they need to to keep to keep our kids alive absolutely yeah. absolutely and, true and i hear that super essential so much. we hear that from schools a lot across the region that they would love to have the funding for for more counselors. That's yeah. And which brings me to the marijuana host agreements because when these first came in the state, the people signing them were 
a fit, and I and I'm specifically referring to Salem's, which I remember looking at the city of Salem's mm. host agreement, which was one of the first, which specifically provided for the funding of a, a, a adjustment counselor in that local high school mm. and gave a price and everything, and that has never been ruled illegal. That is never and but counties or whatever. There's we're hearing don't ask them. No, 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 mm-hmm. but. Host towns have asked for that. Yeah, it is in writing, it is binding yeah. contractually, and it has not been ruled illegal. And it's right. really, I, I, and I agree that that's what we need to be considering. You know, more than needing, yeah, that's more than needing more um, intervention. We need more prevention, more um, upstream prevention. And actually, that's a, a big piece of what we, um, our coalition, tends to focus. You, were, you know, you were talking about. Um, sort of depression and the mental health piece and we really try to focus our work on what we call upstream prevention um, with the idea being if we work on getting young people connected to their family connected to their schools connect, connected it, to their it community it all starts in the family the breakdown all starts in the family but it but it extends to schools and communities too i mean we have all and and when we can build that connection and build those social skills and build those emotional skills we're not only preventing substance use, we're preventing violence, we're preventing suicide, we're preventing mental health problems, um, school dropout, you name it. And that's that's um, what sort of get, makes us all passionate about our work. So, you know, keeping, you know, we, we always work to try to keep that in mind, but. So in terms of what the town What you come, can do, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we brought with us a, um, a, this is a town, this is a menu of policy options for towns. You will find that some of these are not totally relevant to your town without mm-hmm. having a lot of retail establishments. Many of these are retail uh, related. Mm-hmm. But especially you have neighbor towns, you talk to your, your neighbor have, select we have boards. We have one bar, we have yes. <laughs> one coffee shop. So, but, I, uh, but I wanted to share these with you anyway. Um, and. Um, there's lots of options on here. The ones that will flag for you um, are. I'll also hand you out. Hand you out. Hand out this um, this packet to you, and one of you has an outdated because I printed one and then I then I printed another. Um, can we give you this after we're done looking at it? Sure. Uh, Go ahead. I, yeah, this is the outdated one. I apologize. Oh, you guys can share. Okay, thank you. Yeah. This the second to last slide at the end Oops. here has municipal actions, right. and um, so here, these are some some municipal actions that mo- might be most relevant to you. Number one, reduce harm and stigma. But and these are not in any particular order. But um, mm-hmm. reduce harm and stigma by convening town forums about addiction. Um, and also possibly signing this anti-stigma pe- pledge. Oh, that's at the end, number five. Um, share available resources about treatment and recovery at town meetings, town halls, board of health. Um, the OBA task force has a million wonderful resources um, mm-hmm. for that. Enforce parks, bike paths, and public spaces as smoke-free for both marijuana and tobacco, and smoke-free and vape-free. Right, yeah, and so, and also, it, it sounded to us um, from talking with Phoebe Walker like your, um, Recent Board of Health regulations were just updated, and we saw that was really great, and that um, uh, Baker was going ahead and um, you know not going to be you know not going to be selling cigarettes to people under 21 ahead of the state guidelines because sure. of the new yeah. Board of Health, health regs. So mm-hmm. that was really great. Um, yeah. But there are things to think about in terms of if you'd like us to look at your. Uh, regs and make sure that they do include the language which would then cover vaping Mm -hmm. and aerosolized products which would include the smokeless vaping devices um, that could be used for both marijuana or nicotine. We could take a look at that. They're not being sold in stores here in town. Right, they're not being sold. That's that's what you would look at. We have regulations that would prevent the sale. Or are, right. are you talking about um, public? But it could be either for for selling, but then also yeah for for public use and making sure that for example, if someone complains to you and says, hey, you know, there's someone sitting outside in a public area and they're vaping, and I don't think they're supposed to be vaping. The question is, can someone tell them to stop it or not? You know, and in mm-hmm. some places 
they can tell them to stop it because it's considered part of smoking and in some places they can. I think probably Conway's regulations do include that, but it's good to make sure and make sure that it says aerosolized. Is it legal outside? I mean, or is it, it possibly depends, town not to town. legal? It depends down to town. Yes, really? it's possibly it not legal. legal. I see it in Greenfield all the time. Right. I, I, and I never heard of it. I that think it, it is not legal in Greenfield. Yeah. It's, never, it's never legal to vape marijuana in a public place. Right. But right. Um, it's, it depends on the town in terms of nicotine. Yeah, so that's it does depend on town. And, I, and many towns have anti smoking and, you know, not smoking in public places mm -hmm. or not smoking within a certain distance of storefronts mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but haven't necessarily updated that to include vaping. Mm -hmm. So, so that's which has, question, you know, the same secondhand uh, yeah. effects as smoking. And sometimes things like signage can be helpful too. Um, some towns are really thinking about where the areas in their town that there might be some issues. So, you know, for example, on Conway Station Road, are there concerns when people are down there by the, you know, down there at the river swimming, you know, are there concerns about people partying and vape, you know, vaping or using mm -hmm. other substances or drinking down there, you know, does, would it be helpful to have signage? You know, things just sort of thinking creatively about, in our particular town, where are the areas and what could be useful? Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things mm -hmm. that towns can do. You're saying there's money for signage? Because signage, yeah. uh, an outdoor sign is thousands of dollars. Right, those can be expensive. Really, right? thousands of dollars. An outdoor dollars. sign that lasts, that, that's all winter, that's winterized, and is that conveys information. I mean, I, I've done this for parks and whatnot, but like that, that's thousands of dollars. Wow. It's a concrete installation, it's the material that can never, it's weatherproof for 20 years, whatever. Huh. That's not well, you like... You stick up a, like a road sign, too. Oh, that's what, that's what a lot of people do is that they mm -hmm. is they do a road sign type that's a little bit less expensive or where you have uh, another where you I don't know College Station Road isn't there an area that has a little covered um, kiosk yes, am I yes, right about yeah, this? Are, uh, those are the ones that start getting so expensive. sometimes no but putting come, something attaching in something there, onto oh. so adding oh. something oh. in there sign. that's to an existing sign that's mm -hmm. already the money's already been spent right, sometimes right. towns do, do you that. do you the, the signs you have do you uh, kid do you run them by kids to see whether kids think that they're effective or not before you come out we with them we have never done that that's, that's a great question, question. because question. the I don't the, at Frontier the signs recently appeared on all the bathrooms saying the the grossest thing whatever plastic whatever the grossest thing about the bathroom is the vaping things that you might bring into it mm. and the kids just all think that's ridiculous right. like, the grossest <laughs> thing in the Place bathroom is the toilet right. and <laughs> the vaping things that you bring into Those it if it falls in the ground they'll pick it up whatever the, but that, that's yeah. just a stupid thing to put, and there's a lot of money that went into that and got whatever. For those kinds of campaigns, yes, we do run those past, but um, okay. but for a sign that says no smoking here, no, we've never done that. But but yeah, but no, you should you should kid proof them because they they're they're on the ball and they yeah. can tell you what oh, works yeah. and what not. Yeah. Especially Absolutely. my daughter, if you pay her like twenty or thirty bucks an hour, so like cooperate <laughs> to the fullest fullest extreme, but. <laughs> Yeah, um, and then the last one here is uh, review the role of alcohol at town events like fairs, or whole, like the Festival of the Hills or something like that. And it seems like that's a very family-friendly event, if we're remembering correctly. Yes. It's not a, yeah. Not yeah, a, but we don't have any alcohol available at the kids' end of it, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, good. That's, that's the point. There are many events around yeah. Franklin County where... Yeah. You know. Well, and also just even if you go on the website for Festival of the Hills, there's there's no big thing that advertises that this is an event where you're going to be having a lot of alcohol available. Right. right. Whereas right. At some of the festivals and fairs that are you know pretty nearby, it's it's clear that alcohol is much more of a focus. Yeah. And beer tent. Yeah, yeah. Right. And yeah. so that's a great yeah. thing about Festival of the Hills. I think you know for the ones that do have alcohol. Um, what you know, there are certain kind of low bar things that can be helpful. Like if there are certain making sure that only certain areas can be used for drinking. That you know, it's not rest, wristbands, but it's hand stamps, things that can't be transferred. You know, so the, some of those are are in the menu of policy options. But um, are there? I guess one of the questions I had too, and I think Kat did as well, is are there other questions that you have or other concerns that seem really Conway specific that you're kind of like right. we've been wondering about this. What about this in our town? Yeah. You know. Well, without without a real commercial base in town, yeah, we don't have a lot of you know that kind of uh, situation where we, we need to be that concerned. Right, um, right, sure. Chief, do you, do you have any things you want to share with us on this? No, no? I mean I'm just kind of taking in what you're offering, yeah. what you've done in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of fortunate in that respect that, uh, that there's not a lot that can cause problems. Right. So I, I would like to see the, um, the heartbeat resuscitator drug 
um, in Narcan. Narcan. The Narcan in every store, every library, every mm -hmm. public building mm -hmm. in our town, and, and everywhere else. And there are the today. trainings like um, I think Tapestry Health and others often hold, Learn to Cope and Tapestry Health often hold, and the Opioid Task Force um, trainings where. Uh, you know, it takes 20 minutes and you leave with a free Narcan kit. Um, so, you know, for the staff at those places yeah. or whatever. And I think your idea about local businesses and figuring about figuring out where to have um, Narcan or um, collection boxes for take back boxes for drugs can be really helpful because we know that in some of the smaller towns, like when I went, and, you know, spoke with um, Select Board and Wendell, they were saying that it didn't make sense because they have a small part time police department to have a take back box there um, because it's not open very much and they were actually worried about break-ins you know so they they were sure. really concerned about yeah. those you know those kinds of things if people thought that there were going to be drugs in a place like that so some towns are thinking about what are the businesses that are best secured best lighted and open the longest maybe those are places to have some of these things available so that's one of the things that small towns can do and that we can talk with you more about we could publicize places. those I mean well, there is a great one right down in Deerfield right um, yeah right and, and that's and another and thing yeah Mm -hmm. We don't, uh, you know, I'm not sure we need one in Conway. Right. And that's Deerfield thing. is, you know, right, right down the street. Absolutely, and that's another thing you can do. You can publicize what's nearby. We actually yeah. brought this, so this is the. Mm -hmm. These are the closest um, take back boxes to Conway, and so yeah, you can see, you know, Deerfield's the closest, and you also have a bunch of other ones. And then this is a cool little map too from the DA's office, which is um, from last year, so a couple have been added since then. But it says where the take back boxes are if they're at the police station. Um, understandably, there isn't one in, in Conway for the same reasons, I think, because it's a part-time, you know, police station. And um, and uh, then also the take back boxes. Mm -hmm. So it shows, mm -hmm. you know, right. take back boxes and, and Narcan also. Um, what, what I'd like to see from a public policy is, is the county sort of emphasizing the disease aspect of addiction and that, um, yeah, because there's a whole undercurrent of yeah, there's entire states that aren't buying Narcan um, because they've made a, deci a value decision that heroin users who overdose deserve to die, right. and that and don't deserve the public resources involved, right. and that that's just such a toxic. Um, kind of, and, and I've heard that take place in this town mm -hmm. that they wish that we don't uh, invest in that they wish that we'd let the heroin users that our department comes across just die mm -hmm. because. Addiction is their choice, mm -hmm. and so the the idea that it's a a disease is still someone something that I don't think a majority of the population agrees with, and that there could be a tremendous amount of public education in that area, which would do a lot towards reducing the uh, stigma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, very good point. Yeah. And the opioid task force is definitely working a lot on stigma issues. Um, as well, and we work closely with them. But yeah, that's. Uh, I think we all need to really embrace the the disease model and and make that clear when we talk, whether it's with young people or parents or whoever. Um, uh, at what point do you do you decide a a public restroom or something like that needs a a, a sharp container? You know, they that's suddenly That's a conversation all that's happening with the opioid task force. Uh -huh. Is how do we get more sharps containers? They appeared out in Greenfield, you know, a year or two ago. Suddenly, yeah. every yeah. Every public bathroom. Oh, no, that's <laughs> that, I, I, people are trying to figure out how to get more in Greenfield, but that's good to know that it seems like there are yeah. a bunch around. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, and one of the reasons that sometimes they were appearing is because um, staff members or employees at certain businesses were finding that they were worried about getting um, pricked with needles, yeah. Yeah. and when they were cleaning the bathrooms, and so they wanted or they were finding them on the bathroom floor in certain mm -hmm. places that were public bathrooms. So there was really a move to say, let's have a really good safe place for these to be disposed of so that no one ends up getting hurt sure. and it, that's a really you know yeah. so that's something that's been expanding mm -hmm. and it's also helpful for people who use needles for all other kinds of reasons for everything from people with diabetes to yes, other types sure. of mm -hmm. issues that you know yeah. require needles it's just helpful to be able to dispose of them yeah. so sure. yeah. yeah we have a few um, other things to leave you with. This is our Dinner Makes a Difference brochure that the Parent Education Work Group has come up with. This is the Department of Public Health's um, new frequently asked questions on um, vaping uh, and e-cigarettes. 
and this the parent education work group every year puts out um, a parent guide in the recorder and this just came out in at the end of September so we'd like to leave you with those and um, any other questions for us or anything else oh yeah these are each one copy of the maps what is your view on towns having a dispenser oh um like a recreational facility I, what is my personal opinion no or we don't have Cog as or, so, or no no um nothing against it at all really wanting to be careful about signage and anything that sort of is functions as advertising to you right so whether that's signage whether that's lines out the door whether that's litter outside um, i think it can be done very well without any of that um, and i think that we um that's what we want to see you know that's that's our interest is in making sure that it is not um promoting the idea and, and not just to youth but also to people in recovery so i think we have a similar interest with the recovery community um, to make our communities places where it's easy to be drug and alcohol free and not feel like you're on the outs, right? And that's um, that's my concern with dispensaries is just how do we make sure that they are, um, uh, you know, still promoting like we still have a wholesome community and it's mm -hmm. easy to be sober, um, sure. whether it's because you're a teen, whether it's because you're in recovery, or whether it's because you're choosing not to use. Yeah. So, Great. That's, that's well, thought. very interesting and insightful presentation, ladies. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much you. for having very, us. Very nice. And please feel free to get in touch guys, if anything comes up work. afterwards. Oh, Thanks so a lot. Much. Thank As you. are you. Yeah, Thank good you. you. Good to see you, too. Take care. Thank you. Nice to meet you both. Um, if you have specific for coming. examples of policies you know, it's late in for you, I bet you do a lot of these. Yeah. So oh. pretty much yeah. uh, everything in this menu oh, okay. will say, right, uh, we'll okay. list the communities that have those, um, that have those examples. So like the responsible alcohol service oh, okay. I training. See. It says I see South Avenue oh, has okay. a chicken, he has a training him, okay. has sure. a orange has it, that kind of thing. Board. Okay. <laughs> Spread the word. Well, spoon. Is that for me? One thing. Why? Thank you. Yes. Why, thank you. <laughs> yeah. my, my, mother, kids. my mother used to break many of these over. My That's life. what yes. I, we yes. didn't even think about that when we had that meeting. My kids were like, "Make time for spanking time." <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It was her favorite <laughs> weapon. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for having us. Have a great night. Yeah. And if there's anything that you'd like us to do a little research on or anything like that. To make sure that the, you know something is really tailored for Conway, feel free mm -hmm. to let us know. Yeah, reach out. We'll, kind of we will do that. Be at your service. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Have See a good you night. Have a great Thank night. You. Thank you. <sighs> yes. Uh, to the halfway through there, and turn. To, you'll see a door on the left. Okay. Thank you. Right past the desk. Tom, do we have any items non anticipated 48 hours in advance? I don't have anything. Okay, and we don't have an update tonight because this is a short meeting. Um, our next meeting is Monday the 29th, which is next week at 6 o'clock here in the town office. Great. To be followed by the all committee meeting. At 7 o'clock, correct? Seven. At 7 o'clock, the all committee meeting. All right. There was something I brought up at the um, at the Selectmen's Association because we had to do a we had to do a I was part of a, a panel and new selectmen were asking questions and that was one of the things that I said was very important to the town communication wise was getting all the committees together and everybody was very happy about that nobody else was doing nobody it. did it I was surprised nobody else was doing that we're trendsetters yeah uh, we're, mm. uh, we must be just like we the must meeting. that's it so um, yeah that's that's great so uh, all right. So if there's no more business to come before the board, do, do any of uh, our selectmen have any comments about it? I thought what they did was excellent. Oh, yeah. Kat does a, does a great job. Yeah. She gave us a, uh, uh, a similar program at the executive board of uh, FERCOG uh, about six months ago. It was basically the, the same type of stuff. And uh, yeah, very, uh, very interesting and, and you know, the Furcock's doing some good work along that along that line, so that's that's good. 
All right, if there's nothing else to come before the board, I'll make a motion that we adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Nice. Aye.